Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hello and welcome to Reliscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions in life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host Aditi Kuti, let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Relationship Science Podcast. I'm your host, Aditi Kuti, and today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sheff, um, a researcher, expert witness, coach, uh, speaker, and educational consultant. And you specialize in research in gender and sexual minority families, um, consensual, non-monogamy, and kinks and BDSM. Am I correct? Is that everything? That seems like a lot. <laughs> It is a lot. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> no worries. It's so wonderful to have you here. Um, and you and I today, we're going to be talking about bonding um, and attachment styles. Uh, but before we get, kind of dig into that, let's get to know you a little bit, Dr. Eli. Um, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and you can just really quick tell me the first thing that comes to your head. Um, what is uh, your favorite book? Oh, that's so difficult to say. I love books. I don't think I have a favorite. I love books. I love reading. Yeah. I love it so much. I can't just choose one. Well, Although I did just read, read um, Upright Women Wanted, Okay, a near future dystopian about librarians. Oh, oh, that so good. oh that sounds I really cool. Totally I'm going to add that really to my list. Book. That sounds Super right fun. up my alley. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. Um, what about a favorite movie? Could you pick one of those? I would say, this is really old school, Harold mm. and Maud is oh, wow. an old <laughs> movie. Um, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It can be a little difficult to find. It's a dark comedy that is still one of my just very favorite movies ever. Right. I've got to check that out. I don't think I've seen that one. <laughs> so good. It's it's from the probably the 70s. Right, right. Um, what about a podcast? Do you have a favorite podcast or one you've been listening to lately that you really like? Boy, I love podcasts too. <laughs> um, what have I been listening to? I'm the same as you. It would be so it's, hard for me you know, to just pick one. It's hard to choose a favorite yeah. for me. Yeah. It is because I just, I love so many that it's really hard to say. I guess I've been really interested in planet money lately, okay. which talks kind of about the impact of capitalism. And spoiler alert, it hasn't been great. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> Never know. Um, what about a famous role model, someone that you look up to? Sojourner Truth mm -hmm. was an abolitionist in the United States in the 1800s, who was such an amazing woman at a time when Black women, formerly enslaved people, were not allowed mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. She made such an amazing mark mm -hmm. in history. And I just... I look up to her so much. Yeah, definitely. A, a, she's an incredible, incredible figure, uh, for sure. Um, and what's the last course you completed? Boy, it's been a while since I've taken any courses. Um, the last like long course I took was for certification as a court-appointed special advocate, which okay. in the United States, we have this foster care system and the children within that foster care system have been removed from their families due to right. abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. And so they get people to advocate on behalf, on their own behalf, the children's behalf right. in yeah. court. So that was quite an extensive 
training. Of the, I would hope extensive. that is an extensive training as well. It's a it very a sensitive issue. Yeah, absolutely. So that training was, I think, a year and a half. Although I did just do a two day course, Aubrey Lancaster's course on asexuality, which I just found fascinating. And she's a great presenter. You can find her online if you're interested in asexuality. She's so impressive. She knows so much. Right. I definitely would love to check that out. Um, all right. That's amazing. Five questions. You got through all of them. You managed to pick one. <laughs> Great job. Um, uh, I guess moving on to bonding styles and attachments. And before I kind of want to get into those details, I want to ask what is a relationship? How would you describe a relationship? Um, I think it would kind of depend on what kind of relationship you're asking about. Mm -hmm. um, just very blanketly, a relationship is when people are interacting. And um, probably over time, probably know each other and interact. I guess you can have like a very brief relationship with someone on the bus that you sit next to and talk about the weather Mm -hmm. or something. But um, to me, relationships kind of constellate around interaction, human interaction and people talking or texting or, you know, like, I don't think it ha necessarily has to be in person. I mm -hmm. think people can have close and deep relationships online, mm -hmm. sometimes with people they've never even met in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes you can meet someone in person a lot and never really get to know them, you know? So that was a mushy answer. <laughs> it was a good one, though. It definitely starts broadly. Um, something that we focus on on our podcast is romantic relationships. How would you define that? Um, I would say for people who have that romantic tendency, generally it's about falling in love. Right. Um, some people um, who are aromantic don't necessarily like orient that way about falling in love, but they still have relationships mm -hmm. and they can feel very deeply about the people they're in relationship with, but it doesn't necessarily mean they feel fall in love. Sometimes right. they talk about yeah. growing into love, like coming to love someone over time, mm -hmm. um, which is a time honored tradition. In mm -hmm. fact, in cultures around the world, this idea of you meet your soulmate and you fall in love and, you know, you live happily ever after. It's not very realistic. It's difficult to sustain. And it's a very kind of independent idea as if this person exists in a vacuum, you know, right, like yeah. devoid of other connections, which it makes a great fantasy. But in reality, generally, those relationships are actually embedded in real life. Mm -hmm. So even if you do feel like you're falling in love with someone, you probably then also have to deal with, do they leave the cap off the toothpaste? You know, do they... <laughs> yeah put the empty box of cereal back in the cabinet, which no one should do. Do they not know where uh, things are in the grocery store and then call you up in the middle of a grocery shopping um, journey asking where things are when it's... Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure plenty of our listeners can relate to that for sure. Um, I know you were talking about, you're talking about romantic relationships and we talked about how they can be a lot of different things. They don't even necessarily have to be romantic to be very strong. Right. Do they still hold the same structure um, and meaning and importance as they did maybe decades ago? Because things are changing. A lot of people are on dating apps now um, and they want casual relationships a lot more than they used to. Absolutely. A lot of people want casual relationships, perhaps even ongoing relationships where people just don't expect, okay, so now we're going to live happily ever after, right? Now we're going to, you know, buy a house, get a dog, have children, things like that. And that just doesn't 
work for everyone. It's not the kind of relationship that everyone wants. However, I would say that romantic love is still in the dating world, kind of the pinnacle of what a lot of people are looking for. And that people have incredibly high expectations of their romantic relationships to kind of meet all of these needs that in the not too distant past were more distributed among other family members, among community members, among, you know, perhaps religious congregations or things like that. And now people have pulled back in some degree from those other elements of community and placed all of these expectations on their romantic relationships, which is actually a lot of weight for those relationships to bear. So on the one hand, yes, people are disillusioned with romance and they're, you know, they watched their parents truly love each other at some point and then come to hate each other's guts and get a horrible divorce, you know? So some people look at that and think, oh, not for me. But on the other hand, we just as a species, we want connection. It's one of the defining elements of being a human Mm -hmm. that we grow into ourselves through connection with others. And when those other elements of community-based connection are harder to find, then we put all that importance on our romantic relationships. And it's a bit much. Yeah, definitely. For them to sustain. It's a lot to kind of place on one person. And I think, especially in Western society, we're kind of taught that we should be. Like we should be carrying that weight for other people and we should expect other people to carry that weight for us when like we've got friends, we've got family, we've got other people who can do exactly the same things probably better uh, because there's less I guess strong emotion involved um and absolutely it's totally fine like there shouldn't be a taboo against that or the expectation that once you're in a romantic relationship your friendships are less important Mm -hmm. you know you put less effort into your friendships which I think is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I've even had, uh, when I was having difficulty with my now ex-husband, I had a therapist, a couples counselor, tell me that I was too attached to my mother and sister. And it was interfering with my relationship that if I would just put everything into my husband, then the relationship would be better. And I was like, lady, you are nuts. No, (laughs) you're a terrible therapist and I'm never seeing you again. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah, that would have been a troubling, that's a troubling train of thought. Um, I guess going back to like being attached, speaking of being attached, how would you define um, attachment styles? The many ways that people can form connections with other people. I think of attachment styles as an internal mechanism where people, when they're in all sorts of different relationships, I think mostly they're they're discussed and applied to romantic relationships, but I think attachment styles are important in friendships and family mm-hmm. as well, all relationships. So they're, how do the people, how do you internally feel about yourself and this other person when you are attached enough to them that it becomes vulnerable. Like you're, you're, they're important to you. So if something goes wrong in that relationship, it's, it can have negative to affect you. Yeah. Impact. So Mm -hmm. it's once you reach that level of vulnerability, how do you manage that? That's how I kind of frame attachment styles. Right, right. Um, And so what are the different kind of types of attachment styles? Is there terminology or is it kind of a bit more? Yes? Yeah, yes, (laughs) terminology. So people can be, um, and I'm not sure that I can can remember every single one of them, but some of them, 
you could be, for instance, insecurely attached. So when you feel that vulnerability, this insecurity feels like, oh, this is dangerous Mm -hmm. for me to Mm -hmm. feel vulnerable to this person. I feel insecure about that. Are they going to leave me? Are they going to hurt me? You know, so which is one of the things I think you you can't really just say, oh, there's this single attachment style because anyone who is vulnerable, you know, like anyone, especially in a romantic relationship, has at some point wondered, oh, I really feel strongly about this person. Is this safe? Is this a good idea? Like, will they leave me? Right, Um, yeah. You can also be securely attached, feeling strong in that attachment that you're not worried really about your partner leaving you, um, you can have avoidant attachment where people who try to get close to you, you throw up some barriers. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes people will have kind of complementary attachment styles. So if someone has an avoidant attachment style and their partner has an insecure attachment style, those two could have some issues around the insecure person being like, don't leave me wanting to cling on. And the avoidant person being like, ah, you're crowding me, get back. Yeah. So um, I know there are more attachment styles than that as well. Um, That's a great place to start though. That's, (laughs) Um, so I guess people can have more than one attachment style and they can be, different attachment styles at different points of their relationship. Am I understanding that correctly? I think, I think that is accurate. I think they can have different kinds of attachment styles with different partners, depending on how the partner reacts to them. So if that insecurely attached person is with another insecurely attached person, they might just want to like glom onto each other and hold on for dear life. Mm -hmm. If you have two people with avoidant attachment styles, they might have a lot of miscommunication around, are you really interested in me? Like, what are you doing? I texted you three days ago and I haven't heard from you. Like, what's happening here? Oh, you're texting me back? Well, now I'm putting you on red for the next three days. You know, like it that kind of avoidant attachment style can lead to lots of like trying to figure out the other person's motivations and are yeah, they trying to control sure. me what's happening here is there like a perfect kind of attachment style compatibility is there is there one that's better than the others or i'm not so sure about better but in terms of an internal sense of security and safety and you know trust Mm-hmm. I would say the securely attached folks tend to have kind of a smoother time of it. I'm not sure that that makes it better. Right. But right. Especially because a lot, you can't necessarily choose your attachment style. Like it's, mm-hmm. it comes from both not only your personality, but your early life experiences. Mm-hmm. So I hate to say that one style is better than the other because it really kind of disenfranchises people with anything but a secure attachment right. style. Right, yeah, yeah. Let's like talk a little bit more about that. How, like how early do we form these attachment styles? What happens, like when do people settle into it and how do they do that? I think some of the the basic kind of groundwork, the fundamental building blocks of the attachment style um, are laid in that childhood period from zero to three. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of going back to that CASA training I was talking about, that zero to three, if your needs as a small child are not met, then it's hard to trust that they ever will be met or that you deserve them to be met. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're zero to three years old, you're, you're not able to control your environment. You're not able to choose the people who give you attention. You're not able to clearly state your needs, Mm -hmm. you know, like you can cry, 
But Mm -hmm. it's very difficult for a three-year-old to say, you know what, I need a more consistent bedtime and I need healthier food. Yeah. Three-year-olds just don't have the capacity. They just babble, yeah. (laughs) I mean, if they have words at all, it's more like mine, more, you know, (laughs) please. (laughs) So I do think attachment styles are important and I think that people can learn over time to become more securely attached in part by working on their own self-esteem and, you know, helping themselves realize that they deserve to get their needs met and in who they're choosing to try to meet those needs as well, that people can get better over time at picking who they're asking to meet their needs and be attached to. So it's like a learning process. Yes. So I guess like, I know you mentioned that like we kind of settle into attachment styles and it's something inherent to us. Are there kind of cases where like we might be able to learn a new attachment style? I think so. I'm not completely certain about that. It would be interesting to look at the research. Mm Mm-hmm. But um, I think if someone, for instance, has avoidant or insecure attachment and works on themselves in therapy or just self-knowledge across their lives, they can look at what are the roots of my avoidant style? Right. Yeah. Probably not safe to be vulnerable as a child. Mm -hmm. Probably not getting their needs sufficiently met as a child. So then avoiding being vulnerable to other people just makes a lot of sense. It's a survival strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And once you're older and you can choose the people you interact with and you can meet a lot of your own needs, you know, as a three-year-old, you can't make yourself dinner. It's just not feasible. As a 33-year-old, you can make yourself dinner. So you're not as vulnerable as an adult as you were as a child, but that reptile part of your brain that is the most active when you're zero to three, I mean, you're mostly reptile brain at that point. There's other things happening. I'm not saying you only have Reptile brain is a really, really great way of putting it. (laughs) I think that's the corpus callosum, that part of your brain that is like the instinctive, like Mm -hmm. I need care, I need food, I need attention, I need protection and love, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you learn to have better judgment about who you trust, you know, maybe your parents really weren't good for you. Maybe they weren't. Maybe even though they were doing the best they could, they maybe didn't do all that great, Mm -hmm. which happens. Mm -hmm. So you can't choose that at three years old. But again, at 33, you can choose who to make yourself vulnerable to. And maybe that includes your family if they are treating you well and you've you've got good connections with them and maybe they're not perfect, but they're at least open to having a conversation about it. Even if they screwed up when you were little and they're like, boy, we screwed that up. We're sorry. We're going to try to do better now. Then having, trying to reinvest in that family attachment. And if the family just screwed up and they suck and there's no effort on their part to do better then you can choose other people. You don't have to settle for the crappy treatment you would get from continued engagement with the family. And Mm -hmm. you can choose other people um, to be close to, to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. with, and perhaps change your attachment style. Although I think when you get into a very emotionally fraught situation, you might revert back to an earlier attachment style, which happens, you know, when people are doing work on themselves and they're trying to learn about themselves and, and do personal growth, you know, sometimes they reach this level where they're happier with themselves, but then something happens and they revert, you know, it's not that unusual. 
Yeah, for sure. So like, I guess the attachment style that's inherent to you, you're always in danger of going back to. In danger, I guess danger is not the right term, but you know, it's always going to kind of pop up and rear its head at some point. It could, especially if you've worked really hard to change it and then something happens in your life that is reminiscent of whatever gave you that attachment style in the first place. Yeah. And then sure. it's not that difficult to go back to it. But it also doesn't have to be a permanent thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have that reversion and be like, oh, man, that just knocked me flat. All right. <laughs> I'm getting back up. I'm I'm doing better. I'm making better choices. I'm meeting my own needs. I'm this person who hurt me or whatever. I'm not going to be vulnerable to them anymore. I'm choosing other people. Right. Definitely. Um, now, we've talked about attachment, but there's another term, bonding. Are they the same thing? Because I think people tend to understand them as the same thing. Right. Um, I would say they are not the same thing necessarily, mm -hmm. that attachment is an internal sense around security and degree of closeness. Right. How secure do you feel with people being very close? Mm -hmm. How secure do you feel if they're kind of further away? How, you know, more this internal sense of how you relate to others on an emotional level. Mm -hmm. I think of bonding as more of a relationship style. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer to bond with friends over lovers? You know, that is a, a legitimate bonding style where your primary emotional needs, your primary social needs are met through friendship. And your romantic right. partners, either maybe you're not interested in romantic partners at all, mm -hmm. or they're of a lower level Priority. of commitment and importance mm -hmm. to these friendships that you've had for a long time. And these friends that have proven over and over, they will come through for you if you need them. And romantic partners, mm -hmm. maybe, the maybe Spice not. Girls bonding, the Spice Girls bonding yes. template. <laughs> yes. Or you might want to bond exclusively with romantic partners and you put all your effort there and your friends are less important. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly been on the receiving end of that. I have the bonding style where my friends are very important to me. Um, but sometimes I've had the experience of a friend that gets into a relationship and then ghosts me. Oh, and that's yeah. really painful for me. Mm -hmm. But for other people... They would be like, oh, no, that's the way it's supposed that's to the go. the way it's supposed to be. You yeah, I've I think everyone's been on the receiving end of that. They've had a friend that's entered a relationship and suddenly that friend's like almost no longer in your life anymore. Just invisible. Yeah, yeah. essentially. Um, in what's kind of the easiest way that we can identify our own attachment styles um, and also our own bonding styles? For the attachment styles, there's a range of online tests and things like that that I cannot think of any right now, unfortunately, but I know there's free attachment style tests out there that ask maybe 15 to 20 questions and then tells you, oh, your attachment style is blah. Mm -hmm. um, for the bonding styles, I haven't really heard of other people talking as much about bonding the way I conceive of it. And I have a team of colleagues where we're working on bonding, mm -hmm. specifically at what we call the bonding project. And um, we've had so much response to our quiz about bonding that our back of the house is just broken. Like the, the technological <laughs> aspect behind that. Right. Um, yeah. We designed it for much lower traffic and we've had so much traffic. It's exciting, wow. but it means yeah. that our system can't handle it. So we're taking the system down. We're going to leave the quiz up with a self-scoring guideline. 
question. Right. Okay. So that right. specific quiz helps people consider um, it's about romantic relationships specifically. Mm-hmm. And it helps people consider if they want to bond romantically, one-to-one, mm-hmm. one-to-many, many-to-many, mm-hmm. or solo. And we love that framework. We're really excited about it. And it turns out that we need to kind of disaggregate that. We freighted a lot onto that one quiz and it was kind of too much. We were trying to just have like a one strike thing and we realized, so now what we're doing is developing separate quizzes. So there's a separate quiz for sexual bonding and a separate one for romantic bonding and then a separate all sorts of different separate ones for how you want to kind of manage your resources in bonding so for instance money do you want to share money with your partners do you want your money all to yourself do you want to share some money in some ways time we're going to be asking about um family are you wanting to build family with these with your romantic partners what does family mean to you does that include children or not are you looking at you know a family of all adults or something um so while the initial test the first bonding test um is useful for considering how many people you want to bond with at the same time um it didn't sufficiently cover non-romantic bonding, Mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. Asexual people and aromantic people also want to have bonds. Of course. And we just we were overwhelmed by too much and (laughs) tried to do too much with one quiz. Right. So now we're we're in that process of the old quiz is we just can't sustain it with the back of house complexity of so many people taking it. We're excited that so many people are interested in it. And we just had such high levels of response that it just broke our system, unfortunately. So we're fixing the back of the house system and we're creating all sorts of new quizzes to kind of disaggregate that singular bonding style into a more accurate way, I guess, to think about bonding, that it has all of these different aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those resources, those quizzes you were talking about sharing resources and imagining how to share resources, you know, basic things like money, um, family building, that stuff that we take for granted when forming relationships, especially romantic relationships. But it is so important to have those set out very clearly and understand what your expectations are. Absolutely. And ideally, sooner than later, you know, that ideally you have discussed precisely how you want to do family building before someone gets pregnant, you know, because once somebody's pregnant, all of a sudden, this discussion of should we circumcise? Should we vaccinate? Should we raise this child in a religion? Those can be incredibly difficult conversations. And if one person wants to circumcise and another person does not, there's no halfway with circumcision. You either do it or you don't. Yeah. So what happens when you have very differing ideas around circumcision? So better to discuss that before, ideally, yeah, before you know. someone yeah gets knocked up for sure. Um, Absolutely. You've already kind of introduced the bonding project, but kind of tell us real briefly, summarize what it is, how you got started. What is it for? Um, so my, my colleague, Jess Wise, um, has been dating a lot. And she felt that if she just had a quiz she could give people before she dated them to, to find out what they want from a relationship that it would save her a lot of grief because she wants, she's a very loving person and she does fall in love and she has sexual relationships, but she doesn't want 
the kind of expectations that often come with that. And she doesn't put those expectations on her partners. Mm -hmm. So she has a lot of freedom. She can love you deeply and still want you to live not in her bedroom. You know, like, right? Yeah, have her own space, have time to do other things. Mm -hmm. So it was her idea originally, and she approached me with it probably six or seven years ago, quite a while ago now. And the two of us together wrote all these interesting things and had all of these fantastic plans that never really went anywhere because we're both kind of big picture thinkers and we've got great ideas but making them into an actual usable thing we had no progress towards at all <laughs> so um she found two additional people kirk and shay to help us and as soon as they joined the team things started happening like we went from all sorts of great ideas to actual real lived experience things. And oh, it was just what we needed. We're the more kind of practical people to join the team. Right. So yeah. we released the original bonding project quiz in January of 2021. Um, it was kind of a, a pandemic project for us because we were all stuck at home and yeah. things that had been taking our time weren't as pressing. And so we had a little bit of time to work on this. So the time and then adding the practical people made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So we released the quiz in January of 2021. And since then, it really just finally broke maybe two or three weeks ago at the most. Oh, wow. yeah. It just, kaput unfortunately right. oh no <laughs> um, the, the back of the house system was just like too much but before that we had 15,000 people over 15,000 wow. people I don't know what the final count was when we took it yeah. down um take the quiz and got some really useful feedback first that people thought it was really accurate Mm -hmm. A lot of people felt their, re their results were quite accurate. Second, that some of the language was difficult. And I absolutely see where they were coming from with that, that some of the questions, it's hard to ask about solo bonding without using the words yeah, solo bonding. Of you know, course. But we didn't want to throw that in there. Um, yeah. So we've improved the language significantly on the second try test. Yes. And then third, that um, it was trying to do too much, that there wasn't room for an asexual person, for instance, to respond because mm -hmm. it was all about romantic and sexual bonding and they felt like it, it just wasn't Inclusive. targeted at them. Yeah. And they were right. This first test was about romantic and sexual bonding. Mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of breaking that out into emotional, sexual, romantic, time, you know, other ways. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, what are kind of three good things about the project? Because a lot of 15,000 people is a lot. So clearly there's something there that people have really taken to that was different that they didn't necessarily see before. I think on the user end or the bonders end, just being able to think about, oh, there's all these different ways to bond. You know, maybe people have been acting in a solo manner, but haven't really thought about it that way and haven't, you know, kind of applied that to their self-concept in a way. So having this idea that these are just ways to bond and there's no judgment about them, you know, no judgment, at least coming from us at the bonding project. Right. We yeah. feel like any way you want to bond is legitimate. You know, like if you want that one-to-one -one bonding and I'm a one-to-one -one bonder, I'm kind of like the, <laughs> the token one-to-one -one bonder on the team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they never give me crap about it. And we never give anybody crap about how they want to bond. So this idea that 
it can be kind of value neutral, these ways to bond, has blown some people's minds. They feel like this weight has been lifted from them. And obviously, we're coming from a value neutral position. That doesn't mean the rest of the world is value neutral about these bonding styles of course. at all. But that's a second good thing is that we are seeing really significant generational implications about bonding and this judgment coming especially from older generations that one-to-one bonding is the only legitimate way to do it Mm -hmm. and that people should get married and stay married even if they're miserable, you know, and everyone should have children. And if you don't want children, there's something wrong with you, you know. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work anymore for millennials and for Gen Z. That idea of everyone should have children, a lot of people can't even afford to pay rent without two or three jobs. Mm -hmm. How are they going to care for children? How are they going to afford to quit two of their three jobs so they can be there for their children? It's just not feasible. Um, A lot of people feel like this kind of older generation that is completely ignoring climate change, that we're leaving them with a burnt husk of a planet and they don't want to have children who will not survive. Mm -hmm. I think that is legitimate. So kind of taking away this idea of everybody's got to do it this one single way that really does not work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a very strong trend among especially younger people, millennials and Gen X, very strong trends in our data um, towards either one to many bonding or solo bonding. Mm -hmm. Not that no one is interested in one to one or many to many, But those two, one-to-many and solo, seem to perhaps fit people's lives better, maybe, now. I mean, a lot of people who had really, in previous generations, invested deeply in one-to-one bonding were then incredibly disappointed when it did not work out the way they had anticipated, you know. Happily ever after doesn't happen for everyone. And I think for a lot of millennials and Gen Z folks watching their parents get divorced, you know, a lot of them are thinking, if I never get married, I never have to get divorced. (laughs) And if you never get married, then your whole life trajectory has potentially more flexibility. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I took the quiz and um, it said that I was, amongst other things, comfortable with solo bonding um, or solo attachment or bonding. I believe attachment is different from bonding, so I shouldn't say that. (laughs) But um, I that made a lot of sense to me because for me, I find that like, yes, I'm hosting a relationships podcast, but relationships are not really as much of a priority for me. They might be one day and that fantasy of that one-to-one relationship has got a very strong hold on me. And I think people my age deep down still want it, but they just don't see it as a realistic possibility anymore. And, you know, cost of living is just so high right now. I've got to fend for myself. (laughs) Thinking about another person, you know, unless they can help with rent, I'm not interested. (laughs) So Absolutely. I think that tends to be the mindset of most people um, in my kind of generation. I'm in my late twenties. So mm-hmm. I'm sure people even younger have even stronger feelings towards it because they think things have changed very drastically, I think in the past 10 years. And, Oh, absolutely. You know, Gen Z, I think have faced the worst of it. So. And the poor millennials have gotten it multiple times, Mm -hmm. you know, like they've had some of the worst economic disasters in their lifetime. It's really not surprising that they are not in great economic shape 
the poor generation. I'm a Gen Xer and we are kind of like the, in the middle of like kind of no man's land where we're, yeah. we're not the, we don't have the money that the baby boomers have, but we were perhaps a little more stable until the, at least in the United States, the 2008 housing crisis wiped out my generation too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So pretty much everybody after the baby boomers is like, this isn't working that well. <laughs> this is not functioning the way you all said it was going to. You baby boomers promised us good stuff and we're yeah. actually drowning in your filth. For sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, I guess Thanks, baby. <laughs> I guess that's something that I wanted to bring up is like what are, you've already talked a bit about this, but what are the caveats of this project? Uh, yes, the bonding project caveats. I would say for one, especially the first test is all about romance and sex and not about other kinds of bonding. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the language is just bad. Just <laughs> difficult yeah and we tried and tried to make it good we rewrote that thing hundreds of times so it's the best that it was but it's still a few of the questions are mm. just like you're like what is this asking me i don't even know what you're talking about <laughs> so that's not ideal but we're fixing it right right i would say those are the two primary caveats changes changes on the way um how was and it how, was the beta test like we knew right. from the beginning it right. wasn't going to be the final thing mm -hmm. um so we knew that we would improve it we didn't really realize how much improvement it would need <laughs> but i even with i mean it's a flawed test but even with that it's a useful tool even oh for sure flaws. yeah i guess my next question is like how does the test impact, you know, your personal development and your perception in life? I think it really depends on the person who takes the test. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, coming out as a one-to-one -one bonder, that kind of reinforced for me in a way what I had, what had taken me years, 25 years of trying to be polyamorous. Until I was finally like, that's not working. Right. <laughs> that's okay. not me. Yeah. You know, it took me, maybe I'm a slow learner. I don't know. <laughs> but although that's difficult because when I'm not in love with someone, if I took the test as a, I'm not in love with anyone, I can absolutely do solo, one to many, no problem. Mm -hmm. As soon as I'm in love, like I am that kind of, allosexual, which means I enjoy sex. I do have a sex drive and a romantic person. Mm -hmm. So as soon as those two combine, I'm not interested right. in other people. Right. Um, but it took me a while to figure out that was the threshold. Because when I'm dating, I can have sex with multiple people. They can yeah. have sex with anybody else they want. I don't really care. Yeah. But the shift for me comes as soon as I'm in love with someone, That's all bets it. are off with yeah. me seeing other people. Um, so for some people like me, I think I, I learned something from the quiz that I had taken a long time to learn in my regular life. I think for some other people, especially the folks who've never considered any other kind of bonding... Um, it can really be an eye opener mm -hmm. about just even thinking about these other ways to bond. Um, and then I think for other people, it can be a little bit shocking to even consider those. Like when we were, there's this way that you do what's called pilot testing when you write a survey or something, you have other people take it before you release it. Right. And yeah. I very strongly remember this one monogamous person who couldn't even finish the quiz. Oh, it was wow. so upsetting for her. She wrote us this email about how we were contributing to the downfall of society 
oh my goodness. by even bringing this up, by letting people think that this was a legitimate way to have a relationship. Right. We were actively evil. And right. she was going to tell everyone, do not take this quiz. Okay. Right. And I was like, wow, I'm so sorry that it, you know, you felt so hurt mm. by this. But to tell us we're evil, mm. we're not evil. Mm. And if you want to bond one-to-one, that is legitimate. That is fine, mm. you know. But then to judge other people for not bonding the way you want to bond Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, like if they don't want to bond one to one, don't date them. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to tell them they're evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I so I took the test, and my results were I was comfortable with one to one bonding and solo, which is what I expected. Uh, but it also said I was comfortable with many to many bonding. And challenged by one to many bonding. Now I'm a bit I'm a bit confused by that because I expected being challenged by one to many bonding. I am inherently an extremely jealous person. So it's bound to happen. But the many to many, I'm just wondering, like, could that be because like as long as, you know, if I'm doing it, then so are they. It's it's kind of it's it's okay. Absolutely. I think it could definitely be that. Many to many is also, I would say, a desire for community, close knit community. And in the not so distant past, people have had more access to communities. People used to know their neighbors more. And at least in the US, we move so much, a lot of people don't know their neighbors anymore. And religion used to provide a deep sense of community for a lot of people. But in the U.S., we are moving away from organized religion. There are still some people who are extremely religious. So we've had this kind of polarization, like the middle of just kind of regularly religious has moved to either end. Now people are either non-religious or fundamentalist in the U.S. And there's a little bit of that happening worldwide, but that loss of religious community, I think, feels like it's some people feel like they're a little bit adrift, maybe without a sense of connection to the people around them. So many to many, I think, speaks to that deep desire for a close knit community of people that you love and can trust and who will help you and that you will help as well. And that you will be, you will earn their trust and be trustworthy to them. Mm -hmm. And I really, I understand that, that deep desire for community. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of people, it's interesting because many to many is the least desired category generally of the four. Right. Uh, I think because it comes across as so complicated. Mm -hmm. If you are living in close knit community, you know, that comes with the wonderful feeling of being known and held and accepted, but also there are some limits on freedom. If you're going to live in, you know, close knit community, then maybe you can't just randomly invite people to move in with you without yeah. checking with other people. Maybe you can't mm-hmm. um, adopt seven dogs <laughs> without <laughs> checking with, you know, the people you live with. Like yeah. there are some reasonable limits mm-hmm. on that. And I, some people don't want those limits. Mm-hmm. So that's a challenge. If you want connection without limits, mm-hmm then how would you feel if your roommate brings home seven dogs? You know, (laughs) like there's that very fine line to walk, I think. And I wonder if once we kind of disaggregate the romantic and sexual from the emotional, if we will have more people interested Mm -hmm. in many-to-many bonding. I think I definitely had... 
I think I definitely, when you were talking about, you know, having a community of people who understand you and, and kind of care for you and you care for them equally back, I think that's what I had in mind when I was answering those questions as well. And I don't know if I was necessarily thinking of it in a romantic or sexual way, but I'm not exactly closed off to that possibility either. So it was just kind of the idea of just reciprocal care, which was very, very appealing to me. So I guess, yeah, you're on the money there, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, how often should people, if they choose to take the test, how often do they take it? Is it just a one-time test? Do the answers stay the same every single time or do they need to repeatedly do it as things change? We suggest people do it repeatedly as things change, like as many times as they want to. Mm -hmm. I think for some people who are internally very stable and their lives are very stable, there's not a lot of change, they may not experience a lot of change in their answers. Yeah. But for other people, like if I take it when I'm not in love with someone, I come across as one to many or solo, but as soon as I'm in love, I'm a one to one. Right. So that, yeah. you know, my answers will change depending on my degree of external attachment. Mm -hmm. um, and people change over time. Their sexuality changes over time. Their relationships change over time. Mm -hmm. So especially because it's free, <laughs> you can take it as many times as you want. The complication now comes with self scoring, which is we're not exactly sure how we're going to do that. Kirk has been working on that. The implementation guy, thank goodness for Kirk. This would still be an idea and yeah. not a thing without him and Shay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kirk and Shay. <laughs> so they're working on um, figuring out how we put that across so people can still take the quiz and self score. Um, Right, right. Um, so would you recommend taking the test for everyone? You mentioned that obviously asexual, aromantic people currently can't really relate to it in its present form. Who do you feel that this will benefit the most? Um, I think a few different people. Um, one young people who are wondering, you know, they're new at relationships, they're just kind of figuring things out and they're wondering what might work best for them so they could take it and just use it as a tool to think about, you know, introspection. What do I want? Mm -hmm. um, people who are considering, who are in relationship and considering a change Maybe they're thinking this isn't working that well for me. Is there some other way we can arrange this that it might work better? Uh, people who are freshly out of a relationship and are thinking, okay, the way I did that, it didn't work that well. I want to do a different thing in the future. What might that be? Right. And yeah. then maybe people who have not had relationships. There's quite a few older people who have just never quite have found their niche with relationships. Maybe the old style didn't work for them. This everybody has to get married. Everybody has to be heterosexual. Everybody has to want to have children. Yeah. I was didn't just going to say in sexual minorities, like so many in their Absolutely. adult life have not had relationships at all because they're not in environments where they can pursue them. So, yeah. Or it's not safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So maybe people who are thinking, oh, I'm, I'm changing. I've been kind of relationship free mm -hmm. this whole time. What if I did want a relationship? What might that look like? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much for anybody who's interested in getting to know themselves more, getting to chat with their partners about what do you think about this? I took this test and it said, you know, I was comfortable with this, but uncomfortable with that. What, what do you think? How do you feel mm -hmm. about that? Um, we're not really saying it's a diagnostic tool in the way that it says, 
this is who you are and you will be this way forever. Right. You know, we're yeah. putting you in this box and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's more of a conversational tool, conversations right. with yourself, conversations with others. Right. Yeah. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, people who have taken the test and they've got their results, where do they go from here? Is there like a practice or a habit that they can combine, that they can now utilize now that they've taken the test and use their results for? That is a great question. Um, we actually created a community for people on the Discord platform, which has been in the past a gaming platform. I'd never even heard of it. <laughs> um, but it's a free platform that you can just enter. And so we have all sorts of discussion, not only about the four different styles of bonding that we identified, but then also about sex and dating and romance and family and friendship. And um, so people can go there, the Discord community, the Bonding Project Discord community. We are also creating a wiki um, where all of our resources will be grouped into one-to-one, -one, one to many many-to-many, -many, and solo, as well as having, you know, like a family grouping or, you know, kind of tagged in all sorts of different ways so that um, people, when they get their results, have resources they can yeah. go and look through. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process of building that right now. For sure. Um, and people, I guess, who might have taken this test along with their partner or partners, what kind of conversations should they be having after they take this test? Where do they even begin? Well, I think comparing their results can be super useful and not just the results, but looking at the actual questions they answered to see you know, if one of you has very wide boundaries emotionally, but smaller boundaries sexually, mm -hmm. and the other one has very wide boundaries socially, but smaller boundaries or wide sexual boundaries, but smaller emotional boundaries, mm -hmm. that's a great place to see, okay, we need to talk about this and think about this and see if there's some place where we can create a compromise because on all these other things we're in line and we're not going to have issues around that but this one like emotions and sex we differ there significantly so we better talk about that mm -hmm. um before somebody has sex that the other person is like, oh no, you know, or someone has an emotional affair and they're thinking it's just connection and the other person feels betrayed. Um, yeah. Just learning where you have strong overlap and where you have disjuncture, I think can be super useful, especially because the test is an external thing. You can talk about, this external thing and not, well, last Thursday, <laughs> you looked at her for 3.7 seconds too long. I noticed you looking at her ass and you are in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. you know, whereas the, it's more kind of abstract in a way is sometimes easier to talk about. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. to know what you need to talk about. Some people who haven't thought that deeply about relationships and are just like, of course, we're both going to stop talking to our exes as soon as yeah. we're together. Of course. But for other yeah. people, they're like, no, my ex is my good friend and we don't have sex anymore, but I still care about them. I'm obviously, I'm not going to stop talking to them. Why, why would you think that? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. All right. We've got some questions um, from our audience that, are, that they've sent Great. in um, that they want to know with regards to attachment styles and bonding styles. So the first question is, when a person is attached to another, yet their feelings are not reciprocated, how can one accept that and move on? Oh, that's so difficult, mm -hmm. especially when you really love that other person and you're just very 
interested in them and they just do not feel the same way about you. Yeah. I would say creating distance, which is the exact opposite. When you are, when you want to be with that person, you want to spend time with them, you want to be close to them. The idea of trying to refocus elsewhere is yeah. exactly the thing you don't want to do. But if it's clear that this relationship that you're so focused on is never going to be what you want, it's never going to meet your needs, Mm -hmm. then distancing yourself from it to create an opportunity to meet someone that actually might meet your needs Mm -hmm. can just help the entire process of getting over that other person. Um, The one caveat I would say is that sometimes people have a, it's kind of a constant thing for them that they're constantly falling for other people who are unavailable. And then I'm a big proponent of therapy. I got to say, I have a counselor I love right now after looking really hard for a good one. He was the fifth one I found and oh, it was so worth it to keep looking because he is fantastic. Um, I think everyone can benefit from counseling. And especially if you find yourself constantly falling for people who are not available to you, it might be worth kind of investigating what's happening with that dynamic. The kind of cliche is that you don't really want intimacy. You don't really want a partnership. It's more kind of not only fun, but safer to want someone who you'll never actually be able to have because what if they, if you have them and you have that level of vulnerability and then you really could be hurt, you know, by someone who's actually close to you. I don't know if that's what's happening for this person, but that's kind of a, a formulaic response that a lot of therapists think if you constantly are falling for someone you can't have, maybe that's a way to protect yourself. From yeah, the there are no, the they haven't given any details, but that's definitely a place to start if that rings yes. true. Um, to what degree is attachment considered healthy and what is the line between just being very attached um, and it actually becoming toxic? Mm. Well, I would say in general, attachment is quite important for humans. As a species, we need attachment. With no attachments at all, we run the risk of all sorts of bad things yeah. happening inside and outside. Like, So yes, attachment is important. I think when it flips into something potentially uh, negative for your life, is when that attachment costs you more than it gives you. And in the moment, attachments don't have to be equal all the time. I mean, in the moment, especially over time, things shift and change in relationships, and that's totally realistic. But if you become kind of calcified in an attachment where it never meets your needs, you're the one who's always giving too much and the person never returns it, that is not healthy. It's not good for you. And you deserve better and you can find better. You don't have to put up with that. So when the attachment does more damage to you than it brings you good things, that's a warning sign. Right. That's when the red flags should be appearing. Um, What is the difference between being love and attachment? Is there a difference at all? I think so. I think attachment can take all sorts of forms. It can take a social form of you can be very attached to your horseback riding friends. You know, even if you're not in love with them, they can be close friends that you can feel very strong attachment to. Absolutely. I think love is one form of attachment. And we kind of are are a bit obsessed with romantic love in general. Um, And it's fun. It's exciting. I understand the draw. Absolutely. 
oxytocin. But it's not necessarily the most stable form of attachment, certainly not the only form of attachment. So you can invest in romantic love, absolutely. And if that's your only form of attachment, it leaves you vulnerable to the end of that relationship and then you have nothing. So I suggest a range of attachments. Sure, fall in love with people, but also cultivate your friendships. Cultivate, if your family is good to you, cultivate your family relationships. You know, cultivate a strong relationship with yourself Mm -hmm. as well. Um, I think kind of putting everything else on hold for the exalted romantic love is a mistake. And I guess follow up on the same question is, can you be emotionally attached and in love? Are they the same thing? Yes. Maybe not the same thing, but I would say, yes, you can be both. Okay. Um, In love is more that romantic kind of glowy, glistening that um, romantic people feel, but aromantic people don't feel that, but they can definitely have emotional attachments. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even to people who love them romantically, they can have attachments to that person, but just don't do the in love thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. That brings us to the end of the audience questions. Um, Now we have the open mic segment in which you get to talk about whatever you like. And you chose to talk about consent today. Yes. Consent is one of my favorite soapboxes, actually. Um, I think perhaps because in the past I have been confused about consent, thinking, oh, I made this agreement and now I can never change it again. Like now I'm stuck and this agreement doesn't fit me now, but I'm stuck because I agreed to it. And it turns out, actually, that consent is an ongoing thing. You can revoke consent at any point. You can change. You can renegotiate consent over time. And I wish I had known that sooner, actually, (laughs) because now that I'm fully aware of that, it's made a big difference to me in being able to say, not only in my own life, but when I'm, for instance, doing relationship coaching with others, that consent is ongoing and evolving and that it's okay to renegotiate. You're not going back on your word because once you give your word, that doesn't mean things will never ever change again. Mm -hmm. And especially, at least in my case, I've given my word under duress. And thought even at the time, I don't know if I can do this, but they're really badgering me about this. So I'm going to say yes, I would give in. And then later feel like, oh, I shouldn't have given in. And now I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not real consent. When someone badgers you until you do what they want, that's bullying. It's not Mm -hmm. actually consent. Consent is freely given, revocable, It can change on everyone's part. So just let's say you've had sex with someone in the past. That doesn't give them blanket right to have sex with you again anytime they want to. You get to say no. Mm -hmm. Or even if you've said, yes, I want to have sex tonight, and then you change your mind, it's okay to say, I changed my mind. I am revoking my consent. Or maybe I said I didn't want to do that thing, but now that I've hung out with you and I see that I can trust you and I'm feeling good about this, I'm changing my my mind to say yes now. It it can go in all sorts of different directions, but that was really mind-blowing for me, realizing that consent changes over time and that just because you said yes to something once doesn't mean that's a permanent state. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my goodness, this changes everything. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for sure. I think consent is kind of. You can give consent and you can revoke it. Yeah, definitely. And I think consent is kind of one of the big issues of our time right now. Like there's so little we understand, but so much to talk about with regards to it. So 
definitely an important thing to bring up but thank you so much uh for joining us uh today eli on the show it's where, been my pleasure where can we find you oh all over the place uh probably one of the best places is my website elisabethchef.com e-l-i-s-a-b-e-t-h-s-h-e-f-f dot com um i blog on psychology today under the name of my first book the polyamorists next door on twitter i'm at dr eli chef um i guess those are the main places right fantastic um and this has been the relationship science podcast i've been your host of the Tiquiti. um thank you to everyone for listening You've been listening to Reliscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Lab. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts, so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found at re.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Aditi Kuti. Thanks for tuning in.